appreciate your help, but you don't really know that's it. That's it. Anyway, I think the sound works for your system, but not necessarily for this room, does it? Okay. Um, the three most widely cited scholars in urban studies, I noticed it also last night in, in a lecture, are Henri Lefebvre, um, Droit à la Ville, the, the right to the city, uh, David Harvey, and Arguably, David Harvey has become more of a scholar of capitalism than of cities. And Edward Soja, um, most uh, very well known, widely known for his work on postmodern Los Angeles, controversial work, then his work on third space and post-metropolis, and more recently, his formidable work on spatial justice. Um, very widely ad admired, and I remember my youngest daughter, who was at UCLA, came to visit with a friend, my place, and the, her friend, also a UCLA student, waxed enthusiastically about one particular course. And one particular pro professor at UCLA, Edward Soja, and his course on spatial, spatial uh, uh, justice. So I was struck one, because, well, how wonderful that an undergraduate student is enthusiastic about a course. <laughs> <laughs> about anything. Yeah. <laughs> Can we be so lucky? And um, secondly, uh, because of of Ed Soya, who I know for many years, um, uh, the work is also admired because of its component of social activism, um, and Ed Soya's uh, work with. Uh, trade uh, unions, social movement un unions, community development organizations, and university ac activism, I repeat, university activism, just in case, uh, <laughs> uh, located at UCLA Urban Planning. Um, I had in fact expected Ed to speak on spatial justice. We simply never talked about it. What would you speak about? Um, but his work has taken a historical and a global turn. And this is more or less a coincidence. Say this is the Mellichamp Global Studies lecture series, not in the sense that every lecture in the series is supposed to be in global studies or on global studies. It is simply to distinguish this Mellichamp cluster from the one in biochemistry. <laughs> Lest you might think this would be a lecture in biochemistry. Uh, and there is a third cluster in, in, in the making, and that's why we call it that way. Um, um, so lectures in this series are not necessarily global. Um, but this simply follows and reflects his latest turn of interest, and. Uh, recently, I think in, in December, Ed, you gave an opening lecture to the opening of the um, Center for Global Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Dear to me for a different uh, uh, reason. So please, let us give a warm welcome to Edward Zoya. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, I, in one of his descriptions of me, I'm, he describes me as a grand maître. And, and I suddenly looked at that word and I said, my God, am I that old? And I guess uh, maybe I am uh, that old. No, you're that well known. <laughs> <laughs> you to do okay. Uh, okay, I, I am definitely going to be talking about globalization and global studies today and taking my title very seriously, arguing that if you think you're studying globalization or global studies today, you must recognize that you are really also studying at the same time urbanization, new kinds of urbanization processes, uh, which are now becoming, I don't know, not identical, but uh, globalization and urbanization are now mutually formative in a way that was not that 
been tense in the past. I know uh, there's a lot of interest here from Jan and others in tracing back the origins of globalization historically. Uh, and, uh, but, but my arguments today are really only over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, that is, the new forms of globalization. I agree with all of the arguments about so much of globalization studies is Eurocentric, uh, rejects and doesn't understand how deep the earth process goes historically and culturally. Uh, I agree, but my interests are very much presentist interests. Why uh, there's a, t a connection with activism uh, is because I'm, I'm very interested in understanding the dynamics of what's happening now so that there can be some intervention to make a difference, make the world better in one way or the other. So I'm very interested in globalization because uh, it, it's been one of the most powerful forces uh, affecting cities uh, and affecting all of our lives over the last, f let's make it 50 years. A little bit too long, but 50 years is fine. Uh, and uh, so I, 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 um, I want to sort of make this connection uh, as intense and as clear as I possibly can uh, by talking, I think, about uh, kind of reframing the debate uh, in global studies with uh, accom accommodating or introducing some new approach. As I said, there's a lot of interest in finding the roots of globalization and in sort of global history, history of globalization. Uh, but my interest, and sometimes I feel it's uh, neglected, the intensity of the critique of, as I say, Eurocentrism and going back, how far back our globalization goes. It neglects the present period of globalization. And this question of what's new and different about the most recent period of globalization. This is the starting point for what I'm talking about. And it's, this question is what leads me to arguing that the difference today is that globalization is being defined by the spread of urban industrial capitalism. Uh, by urbanism and urbanization processes. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem in what I just said in that most people who uh, are interested in a critique of capitalism like David Harvey or industrial capitalism, uh, most Marxists, for example, have forgotten what Marx talked about in the 19th century, and that was urban industrial capitalism. Uh, and that this was not rural industrial capitalism, it was urban industrial capitalism in the sense that this industrialization process was intimately caused by urbanization processes. Urbanization generated the Industrial Revolution, generated the rise of the industrial capitalist city, and generated the beginnings of a diffusion, global diffusion, of industrialization. We've seen the, 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 the giant elephant in our room all the time today is China. It can't possibly be ignored because what China has experienced over these last 50 years, again, that 50-year period or 40-year period, uh, has been the most extraordinary experience with urban industrialism, urban industrialization. They laughed at Americans talking about post-industrial society. And they said, okay, you think you're post-industrial? Fine, we'll take your industry. Uh, and they absorbed uh, American in particular and other productivity in the most extraordinary experience ever in, in a 20, 30 year period, uh, the most rapid industrialization and urbanization in history because they knew that to industrialize meant to urbanize because it was urbanization, it was cities that gave off the force to expand industrial productivity and industrialization. And that this post-industrial thesis was absolutely absurd and misleading. Uh, and that what we need to do is to understand the dynamics of urbanism. Another comment that, that uh, I often make when I talk about this topic uh, is to say I frequently use the prefix post. But there are three terms that I refuse to use the word post in front of. And those are urban, industrial capitalism. Right? 
We're not post-urban. We're not post-industrial. And we're not post-capitalism. In fact, over the last 50 years, the argument I'm going to make is that we have seen something that we can call the urbanization of the world. This is why there is this attachment between urbanization and globalization. Globalization before 50 years ago was not so attached. The world was not so urbanized. Now we can make an argument that every square inch of the Earth's surface is affected in one way or another by urban industrial capitalism, is urbanized. It's not urban in the sense of skyscrapers and big buildings and so on. The Amazon is not filled with skyscrapers, but the Amazon is urbanized. And if you don't notice the urbanization of the Amazon, you won't understand what is happening. That suddenly Manaus has a million and a half people and that urban growth in everywhere part of the Amazon has been enormous in real settlement terms. But I'm saying that this urbanization of the world includes Antarctica, the Sahara Desert, the Siberian tundra, and some would argue the oceans and the air are all being shaped by the predominant forces shaping industrial, uh, urban industrial development. Okay. Uh, this is strange and after the general th thesis I'm making is what I've just described. Uh, this is why we have uh, such new terms associated in the last 50 years. Lots of new terms, new words. I mean, I get attacked by some for making up so many new words. Uh, but the changes uh, are so dramatic uh, that the old terms no longer fit. So there's lots of new terms. Uh, one that's very familiar is NICS, the newly industrialized countries. Why is that? Why is that? What, that, what, what makes that word exist? It exists because before 50 years ago, and for the previous century at least, there were parts of the world that were almost forbidden to industrialize in a full sense. All right? What we used to call the third world was the industrializing world, the non-industrialized world. Those are the words we used. But over the last 50 years, that term has, we've had to change it. Because suddenly we've got NICS, at least. This is what starts it all, sort of six or seven East Asian countries. But then we get Celtic miracle in Ireland. Uh, we have all kinds of newly industrialized countries emerging, China being the most spectacular example of this. From, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, one can spend all the time on China, but I won't. Uh, but, uh, and, but there's also other places uh, that are industrializing that were not industrialized before. 200 miles north of here and 100 miles south of here are two of the biggest examples of newly industrialized suburbs. We don't have a word for them. This is, oh, sounds awful, NIS. Silicon Valley and Orange County were 50 years ago suburban, quiet dormitory areas. They are now thriving industrial hubs. Huh? In Irvine and San Jose, probably there are more jobs than bedrooms. What kind of suburb is this? This is part of this urbanization of the world. Why urbanization becomes congruent with globalization in the last 50 years? Um, as I say, it may not have been about capitalism in the past, but it is now more than just the spread of capital, labor, and culture, which is what has dominated most globalization studies. You know, globalization is fine. It's a, it's a strengthening of the global scale of things and an empowerment of that global scale in terms of its influence on everything. But one of the questions is, what's, what's, what does globalization carry? What is globalizing? And the traditional starting point has been globalization of capital, foreign investment, all of that stuff. Then people started saying, well, labor too is globalizing in terms of movements of labor around the world. And then the hot stuff has been the cultural turn and global culture and apadurai and global cultural economy and all kinds of writings and debates uh, of people here as well as elsewhere. 
looking at what is globalizing. And now what I'm saying is we, we've now combined capital, labor, and culture into urban industrial capitalism as a whole is what is now diffusing around the world. Now, this idea emerges from a series of important intellectual developments over the last 50 years. I'll keep, keep staying there. Uh, it's cyclically much more recent, or more intense over the last 30 years. Uh, but several in intellectual, theoretical, conceptual developments that have reshaped global studies, uh, that have made global studies see itself, see globaliza globalization as urbanization. The broadest of these changes, the most dramatic and the most influential is what uh, I and others have begun to call the spatial turn. Fifty years ago, space was considered a, a, a central concept in architecture, in geography, in bits of urban and regional planning. For a while in sociology, people tell me a little bit in the interwar years in art history. But outside those spatial disciplines, there was virtually no interest in the spatial. In almost all the humanities, the professional fields like law and, 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 uh, and so on, English literature and, 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 and all of the humanities, and most of the social sciences. Over the last 50 years, everybody's begun to spatialize to some degree. Some of it is very shallow and, and minor, but in other places there's a deep, growing importance of spatial explanation. Uh, we'll call it, in a, in a moment, spatial causality. That things are caused by the organization of space, particularly in cities, all right? particularly in this urbanization process. Uh, I've been very interested in this spatial turn, trying to understand it. Uh, re more recently, I've begun to realize that it's not some sort of vicious conspiracy that happened in the 19th century, uh, but it was a very logical outgrowth of German philosophy trying to think very seriously in the 18, late 18th century, the last half of the 18th century, asking a very interesting question. This was the period when the, that the social sciences were emerging. All right? The social sciences that we know did not exist in 1850, but by 1900 we suddenly had sociology, political science or government, psychology, uh, anthropology, cultural anthropology, and so on. These disciplines, economics, how can I forget about economics? Uh, but these disciplines emerged in the late 19th century. And they're emerging as social sciences. Uh, and what they have is physical science as a background, natural science as a background. And so the easiest assumption, and some economists still believe it today, is that the social sciences should adopt the scientific method model of the physical and natural sciences. Uh, but the German philosophers, historical philosophers, some of them, uh, began to ask the question, no, there's got to be something else behind, beside that rigid scientific method of positivism and so on that we can use to really interpret human societies, social science. It's not physical science, it's social science. What can we do? What distinguishes the social from the physical sciences? And they came up with history. And they invented a discipline of history, a, a, no, a ideographic discipline of history, with all of this business about archives and footnotes and you know, written language and uh, that define the historiography, the, the, histor his, the, the discipline of history. Uh, emerges in the 19th century along with the social sciences as the kind of master of the social sciences. Every social science emerges with what I called a form of social historicism behind it. C. Wright Mills, dear C. Wright Mills, uh, whose award I got for sp sp spatial justice, uh, on, uh, um, 
second, rate, whatever it is, as honorable mention. C. Wright Mills wrote a book called The Sociological Imagination. And without blinking his eye, he said the sociological imagination equals an historical imagination. Right? It's historical. Uh, and that history defines sociology and social theory. Uh, and there was something equivalent happening in economics with the eventual rise of neoclassical economics and in politic and political theory. There, there, there was an acceptance of historical causality. And it influenced all of Western thought th that nobody thought about anything else. No, I'm not saying that. There was lots of people who thought about space and geography. Uh, but nowhere was the spatial thinking as powerful and as dominant as historical thinking. Just until recently, uh, if an event occurs of some importance like the crash of 2008 or 9 or globalization or some, the Iraqi war or Afghanistan, and you want to know about it, who do you call on? Do you call on a geographer? Well, maybe occasionally, but the first person you think of is an historian. Historians dominate intellectual acuity, it seems, still in Western thought. Not in Eastern thought, I don't think so. Uh, but in Western thought, the historian is the privileged thinker. And ever since the late 19th century, time and history began to be privileged over what every philosopher up to 1850, and including Hegel, would argue was both spatial and temporal. Can you imagine a natural scientist saying, oh, time is more important than space? You couldn't imagine a physical scientist, a physicist, or uh, a natural science privileging time over space. It would never happen. In social science, in the development of social sciences, and what was happening at the same time as the development of the social sciences was the rise of what sometimes is called scientific socialism, the radical form of social science, if you will, scientific socialism or Marxism, or what's the other term? Historical materialism. Because Marxism was deep as his equivalent to historical and historicism and historicist as the social sciences. They also, it also evolves in that last half of the 19th century to be the predominant form of radical thinking, eradicating a lot of other more, actually more, I once wrote about this, more spatial forms of socialist thought. Utopian socialism, anarch, uh, libertarian and anarchism, anarchist socialism, uh, which has, like Kropotkin, has a strong influence on the environment and territory and location. They were eliminated by Marx. And they, hey, Marx hated them. And Marx really wanted to kill those who were spatial on the left. I mean, he reserved his, I mean, the, who received Marx's most vicious critique? Somebody who's as close to him as anything is Proudhon, the French anarchist. Oh, God, he, has, he had to kill Proudhon. He was too close, and he was a little spatial. Uh, but that's another story. Now, where was geography at the time? Geography was okay. We were geographers in the late 19th century. We had environmental determinism. If we had theorized, we, we were the dominant persons theorizing that the physical environments determine spatial human behavior. Uh, and so uh, we don't need to do any of this historical thinking. And besides, what we shouldn't worry about finding an alternative to science. Geography has physical geography, which is scientific, and then human geography, which is very weak, but uh, uh, in the 19th century, but was growing. Uh, and so we don't want to bother with this. So they didn't participate in the rise of what I call social historicism and its taking over of Western social thought, left, right, and, and liberal middle. Uh, and so this created, in the 19th century, what could be called an historical turn. Every discipline, humanities, social science discipline, revolved in one way or another about around history. And geography, geography was pushed into the background. You couldn't ignore geography. I mean, ontologically, time and space are the most fundamental forms of human life, all right? Uh, and 
just as you can't talk about human society without history, without time, uh, you can't completely eliminate space. But geographers weren't in there, and subsequently in the 20th century, geography abandoned theory because the social sciences said, look, you are very naughty with this environmental determinism. This is simplistic crap. You better drop this or else we're going to get you. All right? uh, and, and so geographers were really, they burned their fingers, oh my goodness, with theoretical work. And they stopped theory for the 20th century, for most of it, until maybe 1970s, uh, later on in, in the century. Uh, but they abandoned the, 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 grand, the grand debates, and they were dominated by historical thinkers uh, all the time. Uh, almost everything that was done in Western social thought. I, I, as I said, I qualify a little bit. I'm not sure what's going on in Eastern philosophy at the time. But somehow I think yin and yang is something that combines space and time better than the binaries of the Western modernist model, models. Okay, so the spatial turn is a massive sea change. Historical turn, every discipline had an historian. If you were an economist, there was an economic historian there. If you were a biologist or a botanist, there was usually somebody who specialized in historical botany, the history of biology. No matter what science, physical, human, humanity, social, there was an historian. That's what happened with the historical turn. It, came, it went everywhere. Every, it's diffused to every discipline. That's what's beginning to happen today with spatial thinking. There's tremendous resistance to it, particularly from historians. And, and they, they have a powerful argument. We were talking about it with Jan before.